A warm welcome to all of you, um, either in the evening or in the morning or in the afternoon, wherever you are, or perhaps also listening to this um, as a recorded version. Um, we have this uh, wonderful opportunity to join each other remotely for this uh, webinar on hashtag music for faith for rights. Um, it's um, jointly organized with the civil society organization Free Muse and the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, it will be recorded, um, so available also on YouTube afterwards. And importantly, it will also subsequently feed into the Faith for Rights Toolkit uh, with its peer-to-peer -peer learning methodology. We will start with an opening panel discussion um, for something like 40, 45 minutes. Um, and subsequently, we will have uh, music presentations and interviews with the artists for uh, another hour or so. So we will have a stellar lineup of special rapporteurs, treaty body members, faith actors, musicians, artists. Um, and I'm, I'm very much looking forward to this uh, exchange. We will start now with um, a video message of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michel Bachelet, on the 40th anniversary of the 1981 declaration, which was recorded for an event two days ago by the International Religious Freedom and Belief Alliance Ministers Forum. Um, so um, let's look at the um, High Commissioner's statement on this um, occasion. Today we commemorate and reflect upon the 1981 United Nations Declaration on the Elimination of All Forms of Intolerance and Discrimination Based on Religion or Belief, which was adopted 40 years ago. It took almost 20 years of negotiations, a road that was long, arduous, and full of obstacles in the world of the Dutch representative in the General Assembly at the time. The adoption of the Declaration on 25th November 1981 without a vote was considered a victory, according to Bahia Tazivlier, who is now Human Rights Ambassador at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Many diplomats, UN human rights bodies, and faith-based actors played an important role in shaping the 1981 declaration. Already in 1960, Special Rapporteur Krishna Swami from India has drafted 16 basic rules in his study for the Subcommission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities. The Senegalese diplomat Abdoulaye Die shared the working group which finalized the declaration, while he was also a member of the Human Rights UN uh, Human Rights Committee. And the result of their work is not only clear and principled, it is deeply relevant today. The declaration has positively influenced legal agreement at the international, regional, and national levels. They include in 1992 Declaration on the Rights of Persons Belonging to National or Ethnic, Rel Religious and Linguistic Minorities, and the Beirut Declaration on Faithful Rights, which emphasizes that Article 2 of the 1981 Declaration establishes direct responsibilities of religious institutions, leaders, and even every individual within belief communities. The 1986 concluding document of the Conference of Security and Cooperation in Europe quoted multiple elements from Article 6 of the 1981 Declaration. Some constitutions and national laws have also been clearly influenced by this list of substantive rights. In Australia, the Human Rights Commission is mandated to look into complaints about practices or acts by the Commonwealth that are inconsistent with 1981 Declaration. This leads me to the practical challenge of implementing the Declaration and monitoring intolerance and discrimination based on religion of belief. We will hear today from Hamed Shahid, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. He and his predecessors have examined many incidents and recommended remedial measures. In fact, since 1986, they have sent more than 1,800 letters and urgent appeals to more than 130 governments and more than 170 other actors, including corporations. In their mission reports and communications, Special Rapporteurs have used the 1981 Declaration as a substantive argument with states and de facto authorities, notably in protracted conflict. Unfortunately, intolerance and discrimination in matters of religion or belief is still rampant in every region. 
The COVID-19 pandemic has been fueled by discrimination, including on the basis of religion or belief. Communities that are burdened with systemic and long-standing discrimination have suffered disproportionate death as well as far greater socioeconomic impacts. The pandemic is also further exacerbating both discrimination and intolerance as people nourished by conspiracy terrorists look for scapegoats. This harms all of us. Discrimination and intolerance constitute terrible and comprehensive violations of the rights of individuals who are targeted. They are also a major obstacle to development. They weaken all of society. Human rights law does not permit derogating from freedom of religion or belief under any circumstances. States must take steps to ensure that at all times public discourse does not constitute incitement to hatred against any group. But in this pandemic era, online hate speech seems especially aimed at minority communities. My office has been collaborating with social media companies such as Facebook, Google, and Twitter to encourage effective and principled responses. The Facebook Oversight Board has used the threshold test of our Rabat Plan of Action in several decisions in 2021, and also explicitly referred to general comments by treaty bodies, reports by special rapporteurs, and the UN guidance principles on business and human rights. We have also been engaging with religious leaders and faith-based actors on relevant issues using the Faithful Rights Framework and the interactive peer-to-peer -peer learning methodology of the hashtag Faithful Rights Toolkit. Forty years ago, the international community expressed its resolve, and I quote, to adopt all necessary measures for the speedy elimination of such intolerance in all its forms and manifestations and to prevent and combat discrimination on the ground of religion or belief, end of quote. Far more needs to be done to advance this work. The spectrum of rising hatred on the basis of religion or belief should alarm everyone. No vigotry of this kind is acceptable, and I hope all of us can use this anniversary as a rallying cry and an opportunity to strengthen our effort. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael, for this uh, introductory uh, fundamental contextualization by the High Commissioner for Human Rights. She actually said three things. She had 40 years ago, she said a declaration which is as relevant today as when it was adopted, if not more. And she said uh, implementation of the declaration, because anybody outside the UN, the first thing that comes to mind, what's the value of declarations? Now, to start our discussion uh, on this fundamental question, I think it's only normal that we start with Dr. Ahmed Shahid, the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations on the Freedom of Religion or Belief. Dr. Shahid, uh, you have been assuming this responsibility for the past five years and implementing the Declaration of 1981 is part of your, of your mandate. Uh, how do you see it during the past five years in which you are in charge? Uh, is freedom of religion progressing or regressing? And especially, uh, what does it mean now as compared to 40 years ago with media and social media, is it a positive factor or a negative factor? Over to you, Dr. Shay. Thank you, Dr. Salama. I'm glad to join you all this evening for this webinar, and thank you for inviting me. It is always risky to generalize anything for the whole world. But as High Commissioner just now said, religious intolerance and discrimination is rampant around the world. For groups in vulnerable positions, the situation is alarming, like the minorities in Afghanistan facing likely annihilation. And this is the only place where minorities in vulnerable situations are facing mass atrocities. And the perpetrators are no longer states, as was probably the case largely in 1981, when we had the declaration framed. But today also non-state actors, including armed groups. Even communities in more comfortable situations, living in established democracies, are also expressing concern about rising intolerance, whether in the form of non-state actor violence or overreach by states. In some parts of the world, conflicts generated by a range of background conditions, from colonial baggage to climate change, from corruption to economic hardship, among others, take on a religious dimension. In other parts of the world, including, again, established democracies, Growing demographic diversity has led to surging xenophobia and identity-based politics, often targeting religious or belief minorities. 
While the role of religion in public sphere has increased generally around the world since the end of the Cold War, the emergence of the internet as the premier global public forum has unleashed unprecedented power to incite hatred locally and globally. Also claims framed as human rights are deployed to construct false hierarchies of rights with religious freedom at the top and at the expense of the rights of women, girls and LGBTI plus people. Emerging technologies, like you referred to just now, Dr. Salama, have also offered new ways of asserting authoritarian control and of interfering in the forum internum, the inner sphere of our spiritual existence, which should be totally beyond any state interference. These are all bad, and there's of course much more besides. However, there are also many good developments, and I could say these are also on the rise. Compared to 40 years ago, there are now more mechanisms and tools and frameworks to protect and promote human rights, including religious freedom. Global monitoring of religion of belief violations has also increased. Our understanding of how these can occur, how, how these abuse can occur, and can be experienced has also advanced, including intersectional forms of discrimination. With the so-called modernization, modernization theory almost on the deathbed, the death sentence formula in religion has also been commuted. Perhaps a very good indicator of that is the Faith for Rights framework that Dr. Salama, Dr. Michael Wiener, uh, had inspired. But there never really was that, a death sentence on religion. Since religion of belief, actors have always played crucial roles in supporting communities worldwide, including promoting human rights for all. Moreover, we now have a more expansive understanding of what we mean by the freedom of thought, conscience, and religion of belief, highlighting the equal entitlements of people of all faiths and none. More than ever, more resources are being deployed by states to promote freedom of religion of belief, which can be very, a very good thing when not politicized. But all this has been tested and is being tested constantly with the most recent challenge, of course, being the COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, they will continue to be tested. In some, the situation ranges from deeply concerned to alarming, while also interspersed with shoots of progress, promise, and opportunity. It's therefore a, a mixed a picture with, uh, with, which calls upon us to reinforce the positives and combat the concerning matters. Thank you. Many thanks, Dr. Shahid, for your inspiring words and uh, also for picking up um, the, the, the threads and, and, and contextualizing it uh, for today's challenges. Um, if we turn now to um, uh, Heiner Bielefeld, uh, who used to be the special rapporteur between 2010 and 2016, and obviously in that context, uh, you have um, used uh, the 1981 declaration in, in various communications. What kind of advantages or disadvantages of this soft law instrument that you see compared to a legally binding hard law instrument? And perhaps if I just may borrow um, and paraphrase a question that uh, Nazila Ghanea from the University of Oxford, who's also listening currently, uh, she two days ago uh, asked a, a, a beautiful question. So if you could add one more article to the 1981 declaration, what would you include and why? Over to you, Heiner. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. And uh, uh, let me say, I'm very glad to be among friends, uh, to see friendly faces, nice faces, and uh, people committed to this issue of FORP, freedom of religion, I believe. Yeah, thanks also for the question, Michael. And uh, indeed, uh, you yourself indicated to one of the disadvantages, okay, it is soft law. Uh, so, and that's why, of course, when it comes to nail states, I have preferred to use the ICCPR, especially if then states had ratified that legally binding treaty. But as we know, okay, not all states have ratified the ICCPR. And um, on top of that, I would also say, I mean, there are specific advantages also in the text of the 89, uh, 81 declaration, 1981 declaration. And uh, so for instance, article six spells out the wide scope of application. 
of FORP. And I think that is important, especially against the background of uh, a perception widespread and also reflected in quite a number of national constitutions where freedom of religion and belief is more a matter of conviction and worship. So you have the inner faith narrowly defined and then worship traditional practices narrowly defined, may, maybe also spatially demarcated, and that's it. And here, I mean, the, uh, uh, the 81 declaration is very clear in having that broad scope of freedom of religion or belief. So uh, including community dimensions, including institutional infrastructural components, charity organizations, making a difference for society as a whole. And I think that is really nicely uh, captured in Article 6. So I think the text has its own merits. But what I like most of it is Article 3. I mean, that is a particularly powerful language, which I rarely find in any UN documents. I mean, that is really the language I love and we should use more frequently. So when it says discrimination, between human beings on the grounds of religion or belief constitutes an affront to human dignity and a disavowal of the principles of the Charter of the United Nations. I mean, that is strong language. And I agree, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, respecting human beings in their dignity, in their inherent dignity is the foundational concept of human rights. I mean, the UDHR starts with the inherent dignity of all members of the human family. So that is axiomatic, but you can't respect human dignity without recognizing that very important dimension of the human condition that human beings are beings with profound convictions. At least they can develop profound identity shaping convictions, which also permeate their lives, permeate society. I mean, that dimension is really nicely captured. And of course, human dignity is the foundation, not only of freedom of religion and belief, it's a foundation of all human rights. But by making that connection, it's also clear that freedom of religion and belief and the fight against discrimination in this area is a contribution to the human rights project at large. It's not a little thing at the margins, not something spatially demarcated, not private idiosyncrasies. It's, it's really, I think, here, and also some in, in many parts, uh, the whole enterprise of human rights is at stake. So in that sense, good that we have it. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Heiner, for this uh, passionate uh, explanation and also highlighting the, the, the positive features. And perhaps as a, as a hidden talent, which many people wouldn't know, you are also a musician yourself um, playing the piano. And uh, just to give you already a first flavor of uh, creativity in this context, um, we will show you just a short two, vid two minute video that um, Heine recorded. And then remotely, obviously, um, I added some, some additional uh, uh, notes um, which actually are the musical notes of Faith for Rights. So you have basically F, A, and then so on, like B, A, C, H, so the, the musical symbols. So you will see this uh, now shortly in, in the video itself that uh, uh, Heine and myself had produced remotely. Faith for Rights Art.
this is just fantastic. The synergy and the harmony and the matching uh, between both of you and between the two powers, Haina. Uh, you emphasize the power of words and immediately after you added the power of music. And uh, this is exactly the whole essence of music for faithful rights or in general art for faithful rights. It's that you are doubling the power. But there is a major difference. The power of words, you can misunderstand words, but how can we on earth, how can anybody misunderstand the feeling conveyed by music? And that's why probably, but this is a topic maybe for another brainstorming, the power of art is even stronger than the power of words, probably. Dian, uh, the power of words mean nothing without the human rights mechanisms and defenders. It's not only the rapporteurs who give life to words using their power, it's the civil society. You have been among the first most friendly, most committed faces I met in all my earlier lives in Geneva doing the same thing. So your own look as a defender uh, uh, of the freedom of religion, uh, how, what do you make out of uh, the uh, 1981 declaration? What did it mean in practice for you as an advocate and as a defender for rights? And I wouldn't resist myself also like Michael uh, borrowing the same question uh, of Naz, which is what would you add if there's anything missing in your view? Diane. Thank you. Me. Thank you very much. I, I just want to say it was beautiful, just this, this music. And, the, and you know, in the Baha'i writings, you have a, a quote that says that music is a ladder for the soul. So it's really very appropriate that we're, we're thinking of freedom of religion or belief and, uh, and listening to music as well when we talk about faithful rights. Um, it's also, I was, we were just discussing and I was just uh, uh, mentioning just before the, the meeting start that, you know, today, I mean, we're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the 1981 declaration, but tomorrow night, the Baha'i world will be commemorating the 100th anniversary of the passing of uh, Abdul Baha, who is one of the key figures in the Baha'i faith. So it's a, it's a synergy. Uh, I know that Heiner likes that, that, that term, <laughs> but it really is. Uh, synergy that is very important. Also, I thought I was thinking because you said, you know, Ibrahim, I've been following this, but I think it's been a commitment of my organization. Um, the High Commissioner mentioned the report of Krishna Swami, and I think we are one of the few organizations that ha actually have a typed copy of this report in our office archives. So just to show that, you know, there is a long, long time commitment um, to this, to this. Um, to, to this principle of freedom of religion and belief. And Elizabeth, I know that you will be talking uh, after us, but I want to say here that, uh, I mean, after me, sorry, <laughs> I don't want to use the royal we, but I want to say here that actually we are committed to freedom of religion and belief, and it means also the choice not to believe. And I think that that is extremely important and it's something that we should all, uh, and, I, and I really want to state it because it's something that we should all respect and, and promote because it's the individual choice of each and each person. Now, what does it mean for uh, human rights defenders? I think um, the declaration itself, of course, even if it's soft law, it's very important and it's a very good term of reference. And I think that of course, those countries that have signed the ICCPR, um, it, it also the treaty bodies give, our, 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 you know, give a, strong, a stronger um, uh, uh, power for, for advocacy, but even the declaration in and of itself is extremely important and is a great tool for advocacy. But I have to say also that um, the this mandates of the special rapporteurs, of course, have been an, a very important tool uh, for advocacy for, for, uh, for NGOs. Um, because the special rapporteurs from the time of Mr. Dalmeda Ribeiro the door of the special rapporteurs was always open to NGOs and we were always able to come and talk to them. Of course, I think it was from the time of Asma Jahangir that the, it was, there was an institutionalization of meetings with NGOs and, and discussing. But I think that all special rapporteurs have always had a, a door open and, um, and it was very important. The other thing that has been extremely important is of course the, um, the country visits. And these, they started under uh, Mr. Af Abdel Fattah Amor. And that was also very important, I think, for advocacy, because there is a big difference between just talking in principle and then having a special reporters being able to visit on the ground and see for themselves and report. And this has been, of course, a great tool of, for advocacy. 
Um, I remember, you know, that uh, once in a conversation that we had a public conversation, I asked Heiner, I think, um, you know, uh, why did, did he think that um, the, 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 the freedom of religion and belief was the poor parent of civil and political rights? And, uh, and I think that at that time, up to that time, really, uh, uh, freedom of religion or belief was not considered in the same manner uh, as all other civil and political rights, you know, and, and was sort of, yeah, the one that you, you talk about, but, you, you know, is, is quite different. And I don't know, it's fortunate or unfortunate, I think probably it's extremely unfortunate for the for the people who are suffering the human rights violations based on religion or belief, but I think it's important for the advancement of human rights and it's important for the advocacy that today we see all around the world so many special envoys or human or ambassadors of freedom of religion or belief. Every single country is appointing one person to focus on freedom of religion or belief. And that is a major change. And I think that this should be really a turning point for me, in the implementation of the declaration and in the importance of freedom of religion or belief for all, all those for whom it matters. So that, that for me is, is very essential. I think the, the other thing that is very important is faithful rights. I think that really thinking about those individuals who have, who want to, who fundamentally, because every single religion promotes human rights. And, and so I think that to reverse and look at the belief, the fundamental belief that was mentioned that is in the majority of people's hearts and to be able to link that and, and, and their relationship to their writings or to, their, um, to, to whatever philosophy they, they relate to that includes human rights and that includes freedom of religion and belief is very essential and is something that will make a difference because people need to be able to relate also to some of these things. And in some countries, theories don't, don't matter. So I think that, I mean, I'm a bit of a dinosaur, <laughs> I think, but the good thing about dinosaurs is that it's very fashionable and children love dinosaurs. So I'm quite okay with it. But, you know, looking at the whole spectrum of the time since I wasn't still working at the time of the declaration, but you know, from the time that I worked with the, in the last years of, of Mr. Mr. Dalmeida Ribeiro up until today, the huge difference that it has made. And I think the huge difference, and I will finish with this, Michael, the huge difference that it makes for people on the ground. Because what we know is that what gives hope to those who suffer from human rights violations is that they know that there is, that the world knows about them, knows that they're in prison, knows that they're being persecuted. And I think that, so therefore, the whole fact that there is more and more importance given to freedom of religion and belief at the international level, at the national level, uh, is essential in the promotion of this fundamental right. Thank you. Many thanks, dear Diane, uh, for really this, this perspective. Uh, and definitely you're not a dinosaur, but uh, I'm, I'm really grateful also for you reflecting and, and referring to the various mandate holders uh, over the past, um, I mean, 35 years. Um, so that, that, that's really uh, also uh, great to, to, to get this um, feedback from civil society. Um, and we will now turn to Elizabeth O'Casey, who is the Director of Advocacy of Humanists International. And um, I think it's also key to um, not only look into the religious side of the right and of the declaration, but also the belief side. And uh, as we already uh, discussed, the 1981 declaration has these two components, but doesn't define them in the first place. So that's obviously a, a bit of a challenge, um, but you had special rapporteurs, treaty bodies, the Beirut declaration explaining it and, and giving at least um, an, a working definition of theistic, non-theistic, atheistic, or any other believers who are equally protected. And uh, Ahmed Shahid in his uh, latest report focusing on freedom of thought uh, was also really um, expanding on, on this and digging deeper. Could you, from the perspective of Humanists International, perhaps give an overview of the challenges and the human rights violations that the non-religious believers are facing today? 
Thank you, Michael. Yeah, very happy to. And just before I do, um, I'd also like to echo Diane's comments and, and say how thrilled I am and grateful to be part of a panel which spotlights the role of art in, um, in helping promote freedom, religion, or belief, human rights and tolerance, and which recognises the true transformative power of art, which I very much believe. So thank you. So to go back to my subject. Um, so yeah, indeed, our annual report on uh, freedom of thought uh, finds that the majority of countries, 144 in total, fail to fully respect the rights of humanists, um, atheists and non-religious. And this manifests itself in, in different ways. So in some countries, it's illegal to merely identify as an atheist or humanist. Some governments require citizens to identify their religion, for example, on the state ID card or passports, but do not allow non-religion as an option. It's also difficult or illegal to run an overtly humanist organisation in 16 countries. And we have found that government figures and or state agencies in at least 12 countries have openly harassed or incited hatred or violence against the non-religious. Um, in some countries, whilst having a different religion to the official state religion is not prohibited, leaving the state religion, uh, what's known as apostasy, is. Uh, apostasy is a criminal offence in 17 countries. Uh, more common than crimes relating to simply being a humanist are the criminal measures against expressing humanist values um, and views, such as blasphemy laws, which currently exist in 83 countries. More general discrimination against the non-religion is often caused not by a desire to hurt them, but by, the by a desire to help one or more other religious groups or belief groups. The promotion by the state of religious privilege, privilege is one of the most common forms of discrimination against humanists and the non-religious, and can be seen in many countries' public services and education. So 79 states have discriminatory funding of religion, and 26 bar the non-religious from holding at least some public offices. 33 countries have mandatory religious instruction in state schools without a secular or a humanist alternative. Then, the, then there's the area of family law, where some countries have family law that in effect excludes humanists from getting married or will remove parental rights from parents known to be non-religious. Currently 19 countries, most of which um, have historically large religious minorities, have voluntary religious family courts for different religious communities. But the problem is for humanists, they may have left or want to leave the religion or family. So sometimes these optional religious family courts can become a trap that is far from voluntary for them, where opting out may raise suspicious suspicions of apostasy or threats of social exclusion or abandonment by one's family. So in my organization, we receive many appeals from individuals living in fear of, for their life, their liberty and safety because of their humanist values. Uh, just this year, we have received over 230 requests for assistance so far. We have one person sort of part-time dedicated to handling them. Typically, these individuals report feeling trapped by circumstance, owing in part to their rejection of religious values, which have placed constraints on their personal lives, education and career prospects. They report having received abuse or being threatened for their beliefs. Many have faced ostracism or difficulty in securing employment. Many of the women who contact us report being forced into marriages or facing familial pressure to conform. They often have less access to outside support or may have only intermittent access to a mobile phone, making seeking assistance more difficult. So these are some of the main ways in which uh, non-religious and, um, and humanists suffer discrimination and uh, human rights violations. However, it's obvious, I think, that most of these are not unique to humanists and, non and the non-religious. They will and they do affect people from an array of minority religious groups too. And depending on the religious history or the landscape of the country concerned, those who are worst off will differ from country to country. So when thinking about tolerance and non-discrimination, we need to ensure the situation of the most vulnerable is our default point of reference. And that's why FORB and human rights in general need to be genuinely protected and promoted for all, whatever the majority belief of the country concerned. I thank you very much for your time. Many thanks, Elizabeth, for this plea. And I really like also this um, joint uh, approach of uh, not letting the different communities be divided, but really joining up. Um, and uh, I, I think that's also precisely as you said, uh, the, the idea behind uh, faith for rights, which is inclusive. It's not just religion, but it's inclusive and of beliefs. And that's also the reason why uh, it's um, uh, faith, basically. Turning now to um, Nachla Haida, and, and we just heard also from Elizabeth, the very concrete problems uh, in family laws, personal status laws, and so on. 
Um, uh, you, Nakhla, you are the vice chair of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. And it's interesting that in the CEDAW Convention, you don't have any reference to religion or belief. And similarly, in the 1981 declaration, there's no reference to women, girls, and gender at all. So um, how is it possible to reconcile these two legal texts uh, so that they become mutually supporting? And perhaps just as a quick uh, related question, you were also among the co-authors of the Beirut Declaration uh, and it, uh, 18 Commitments on Faithful Rights. Um, and if you can uh, perhaps briefly explain also how the gender perspective was included uh, in that soft law instrument. Over to you, Nata. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Michael. And I'm very happy to be with uh, colleagues and friends and also new faces, I think. Um, it is an extremely important anniversary, the 40 years of the declaration that I was not very much aware of, I have to admit. And I think this is part of the answer. Why is it that there is no reference in the CEDAW to religion and belief? And why is it that in the declaration there is no reference to gender? I think CEDAW and the declaration have almost the same age. CEDAW entered into force in, uh, in uh, 1981. So um, I think we have to put ourselves in the context of, of back then when it was a, a misperception that religion, in fact, is against women's right in particular. And unfortunately, this misperception comes from the fact that a lot of the reservations, and as you know, CEDAW is the most reserved treaty, uh, a lot of the reservation state that it is because of traditions, religious reasons or culture that the state party wants to reserve this aspect, this article, that article. We have 440 reservation. I think that speaks in itself of the mis misperception. That's why the two never spoke to each other, but they were so much influencing each other from distance. And I think that personally, when I joined the committee, and I felt, uh, uh, and I want to, to open a parenthesis here and say how important it is to continue to say that we're talking about freedom of religion or belief, including those who choose not to believe and the secularists. Because for many, many years, it was thought to be really pro-women rights, you have to be secular. And that otherwise you can't really be pushing for women's rights because of this perception that most of the blockage and obstacles and reservation are linked to uh, religion. And when we started to look at that and destructure this, this, this argument, and we started to learn about how much work is done by scholars, including women from different religion, from within their faith to reach their rights. And this was a, a revelation for me that uh, uh, occurred all in parallel with the nascent process of um, faith for right, of which you rightly said, I was, I was very uh, privileged to be part of the, of the Beirut Declaration process and then beyond. We noticed, in fact, that a lot of the stagnation in implementation of women's rights come from the fact that we were turning our back on faith actors. We thought we could do the change without them. And we, want, we were perceiving, you know, pursuing our requests for international standards in abstracto of faith. And I think this is why the progress was slow. We have progress, but it was slow and it was not the same. It was an uneven progress depending on societies. But when we started to open up and we started to have the language to bring in faith actors and to um, allow them to understand and see what is being done, what are the scholars study, how progress can be achieved from within the faith, how the issue of human rights and inherent to their faith. Um, and I'm not talking only about one faith here, I'm talking about uh, almost uh, at least three or four groups where there were issues. Uh, on women, whether the right to, for abortion, in, even in Western society, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the church, whether the right to divorce, even in the Judaic society. Uh, so I'm not only talking about Islam. We have to be careful, not you know, say just simplifying. Although the majority, I agree, come in the context of family law within um, a country where Islamic law is, uh, is, is applied. We saw a big difference happening on the ground in changes and implementation 
because we were starting to be inclusive and sharing best practices and showing the link. So this is now my, in conclusion, I don't wanna take more time than my four minutes to tell you uh, how do I perceive the, the commitments. We were very, uh, very uh, lucky in, uh, in making commitment five, the specific gender one, but we, but the women and, and girls and uh, gender issues cut across all the other commitments. It's a, a, a standalone, a specific one on gender because it is important to recall gender specifically and gender equality specifically in the Faith for Right process because unfortunately, uh, the intersectionality of discrimination that women face in general uh, are more often also related to misperception of religion and misinterpretation. So um, I, I think that uh, gender is, is present in, in everything, including in technological advance, in, um, in conflict and post-conflict. I mean, I don't have them now before my eyes, but I could, you know, close my eyes and say, it permeates all the all the commitments, and five is a dedicated one. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Nachla, for this uh, cross-cutting and uh, overview. And uh, just also to um, highlight that in the second part, we will also listen uh, to a music video where you participated yourself, um, and it's on gender equality, um, and it it also uh, includes. Um, a quote that you will be reading in French uh, of the CEDAW's general recommendation and the Committee on the Rights of the Child's general comment on harmful practices. So I think, uh, not as a spoiler, but basically as a teaser for the second part, you, we will also hear you and, and, and see you on gender equality. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me add my, uh, my voice of thanks also, Nahla, for the clarity by which you identified the need to demystify the tensions and the possible mutual enhancement between faith traditions at large, uh, 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 including uh, uh, humanist ideas uh, on one hand and human rights at the, at, on the other hand. Secularism that does not necessarily mean putting all beliefs uh, aside and, and all beliefs have the same uh, equal right. So that was an interesting perspective from Sidhu a committee which defends the, the most affected rights by the manipulation of religions, I would say. But uh, turning now to uh, 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 Mr. Zeberi uh, Jensen, a member of the Human Rights Committee, uh, as we heard and Heiner said that, that he prefers to use the covenant on civil and political rights of which you are uh, uh, custodian Jensen, as opposed to a declaration because it's more compelling. It can, it can uh, 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 corner states more than than a declaration so uh, does this mean that you feel more powerful defending freedom of oh, so or, 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 on one hand secondly uh, now that we heard the contribution of the special rapporteur wh why is it are are the, are are they is their work duplicative of what the human rights committee does when it it does compliance with article 18 or is it complementary what's your experience of the um, the, the, the cross, the, the landscape where rapporteurs uh, defend FOB and also the Human Rights Committee. Does it add confusion or does it add protection? Jensen. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim, for the invitation. First of all, it's a pleasure to join this distinguished panel and to be among friends. Uh, well, I'm one of the 18 custodians um, when it comes to the covenant. So I cannot speak for, for all, but I can give some of my reflections on this issue. And when it comes to, when it comes to the, the work of the committee and the work of the special rapporteur, I would uh, see that as, as complementary. I think uh, my colleagues have already uh, spoken uh, the, the former special rapporteur and the current uh, special rapporteur about how they go about their work and how they use the covenant in a sense when it comes to um, when it comes to those uh, states that are a party to the covenant and then they can use also their broader mandate for those states that are not a party to the covenant so I would see this as as complementary and of course there are certain things that 
the committee probably uh, might be able to do uh, better. And I think there are also certain issues, especially when it comes to uh, responding more quickly to events, then I'm sure that the special rapporteurs would be uh, much better uh, suited uh, to, to, to react more quickly. Uh, also because they're working in a sense uh, all the time, whereas the committee is meeting three times per year, four weeks. So I hope that probably provides a, a short answer to this. Many thanks, Gentian, and uh, I couldn't resist uh, referring to uh, or picking up your point about the 18 custodians in the Human Rights Committee, which is obviously a mere coincidence when we're talking about Article 18 and the 18 Commitments on Faithful Rights. Um, now turning to another special rapporteur uh, on, in the field of cultural rights, Alexandra Xantaki. Um, welcome, and uh, we are not only celebrating today the 40th anniversary, but also next year we will have the 30th anniversary of the 1992 Declaration on uh, the Rights of Persons Belonging to National or Ethnic, Religious and Linguistic Minorities, and again also the 5th anniversary of the Beirut Declaration. And these two letter declarations, they provide explicitly for the rights of persons uh, belonging to minorities, to participate equally and effectively in cultural, religious, social, economic, and public life. Um, so from the perspective of your mandate on cultural rights, how do you see the situation of religious or belief minorities, in particular with regard to their artistic freedom, which is obviously also what um, civil society like uh, Free Muse are focusing on? Um, thank you very much for um, inviting me in this event. I am delighted to see um, that uh, we seem to have similar understandings of culture as a tool and an art part of culture, as a tool to um, advance human rights further. Um, and I think that religion and culture, as you know, have um, a lot of commonalities um, and uh, one sometimes the lines when uh, culture, um, religion finishes and culture starts um, are, are blurred, um, but, but they're also linked by um, what um, Naila Haider said that um, sometimes they are used um, religious practices and cultural practices are, are used as um, a, a way to limit um, uh, human rights uh, by, um, by groups, but, but also by states um, to refuse uh, communities um, to, to, to their rights to religion or culture. Um, and so in this respect, I agree completely with um, um, the, the member of the CEDAW committee. Um, about um, uh, about religion and 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 culture. Um, so um, in 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 my um, in my work, I'm I'm quite uh, determined to show culture as a as a positive and to reinforce the positive um, use of culture as a way to uh, advance human rights. And I'm delighted to see that um, this is what, what you're doing. So to come to your, um, to your specific question, I think that what is really important to, to emphasize is that although indeed the 1981 declaration does not refer specifically to um, uh, culture and, and cultural rights, um, it is only, we should not see it as a, um, as an um, instrument that stands on its own. It is part of the human rights conundrum. And in this respect, it, um, it, it has to be interpreted, taking into account, like the previous speakers have said, um, soft law and also, um, and also um, the, the conventions. Um, the Article 27 ICCPR, but also Article 15 of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, and, and also um, Article 4.1 um, of the Declaration does say that um, states have to take effective measures to prevent discrimination in the field of cultural um, life. So we're in there. And Article 8, again, uh, linking um, the Declaration to other human rights. I also want to emphasize that the Beirut Declaration is very important um, to create these linkages. Um, the, the Declaration talks about shared uh, human values that are common 
uh, roots of our cultures. And paragraph four also talks about uh, common human values. And of course, when we talk about culture as a way of life, which is uh, what, what um, we, we talk about um, these days, then um, the, the human values are very much at the core of this understanding of uh, culture. Um, so, so what is very important for me is that the international human rights system um, focuses a lot on uh, positive protection, and this also takes the um, the the form of um, a positive measures. And it is very important to uh, keep in mind and and uh, remind states um, again and again that uh, when Saad talks about at least when when Saad talks about. Um, positive uh, measures, um, special measures. They they um, actually say that the state is under no discretion, but if the circumstances warrant, the state has to take um, positive measures to protect from discrimination, which includes discrimination um, of minorities um, to exercise their uh, religion uh, freely or not to exercise, um, not to manifest and... and uh, have any religion. And the second element that I want to say in this respect um, is the importance of effective participation, which you can see in the 1981 um, declaration, sorry, you can see in the 1993 declaration on minorities. Um, and, and I think this is something that we still have to reflect a lot. And effective participation at times means um, allowing the, the um, religious groups not only to participate, but also to lead uh, programs and to tell us how to help them uh, realize their their right to religion and, and their right to culture. Many thanks for also emphasizing really the, the positive protection, the positive measures, and also the positive contribution of art. So I think that's a, a beautiful segue uh, into our second part where we will be showcasing several artistic um, and, and musical um, uh, uh, representations. So the first um, music video that we're going to show now um, is precisely uh, putting to music and to a video uh, Article 2 of the 1992 Declaration uh, on persons uh, belonging to minorities. And just to give you also a flavor of who participated in this completely remotely uh, produced uh, music video. So we have singers and musicians Maria Kochevska, Ali Miklos, Mostafa Bitari, who we will be uh, talking with shortly, uh, Lean Mostafa and Damianos Serefidis. All of them are either former OHCHR minority fellows or current staff members. And then the text of the 1992 declaration is spoken in the six official UN languages by the Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, Fernando Varen, by the Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief, Ahmed Shahid, who we just uh, heard. Uh, religious leaders themselves. So we have Rabbi Marcello Polakov um, and Aza Karam, who's the Secretary General of Religions for Peace, and also uh, senior minority fellows, Vyacheslav Mirkachev and Mirka Morera, and staff members of OHCHR, Chianu Lim. So let's watch and listen to their joint message. Um, and that's basically also just for, for three minutes. Um, here we go. Declaration on the Rights of Persons Belonging to National or Ethnic, Religious and Linguistic Minorities. Personnes appartenant à des minorités ont le droit de participer pleinement à la vie culturelle, religieuse, sociale, économique et publique. Persons belonging to minorities have the right to participate effectively in cultural, religious, social, economic. Public 
personas pertenecientes a las distintas minorías tendrán el derecho de participar activamente en las decisiones que se tomen respecto de dichas minorías a las que pertenezcan o de las regiones en las que vivan. يكون للأشخاص المنتمين إلى أقليات الحق في إنشاء الرابطات الخاصة بهم والحفاظ على استمرارها Лица, принадлежащие к меньшинству, имеют право устанавливать и поддерживать без какой-либо дискриминации свободные мирные контакты с другими членами своей группы и с лицами, принадлежащими к другим меньшинствам. So with this uh, music video, we'll turn to Mostafa Bittari. Uh, you are um, uh, a former OHCHR minority fellow and a Palestinian refugee uh, who grew up in Yamuk camp in Syria. But now you live in the Netherlands and you work as a program coordinator and a workshop leader for various NGOs um, and also the international spotlight team. Um, Since you were also part and parcel of bringing people together for this music video um, and the other artists, let me just enumerate where they are from. So they are from Brazil, Canada, Chile, Egypt, Germany, Malaysia, Maldives, North Macedonia, Syria, United Kingdom and Ukraine. So please, can you explain how this video was produced remotely and also which message you want to convey? Uh, actually, hi, and thank you uh, for this opportunity. Uh, uh, this video is fantastic, and we are working with many initiatives related on the art and culture with the minority fellows and uh, many people, and also in the refugee camps uh, and the minorities uh, here in Europe. So it was uh, one initiative uh, like what we are doing already. So the people uh, so uh, interested in and uh, they start to be more and more uh, with this video. So it was a great opportunity also to talk with the colleagues and to uh, do something to let uh, the people hear what we are uh, doing and what's important for us also. Many thanks, Mustafa. And we will actually also watch another video later um, where um, the actual the voices and the storytelling of uh, the minorities themselves will be uh, showcased. So uh, stay tuned on that. And uh, with this, we'll now turn to Bruce Adolf. Uh, you are a composer, a pianist, a resident lecturer, and director of family concerts for the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, and also author of several books. Um, we will shortly hear and also watch an excerpt of um, I Will Not Remain Silent, which is your concerto for violin and or orchestra, based on the life of Joachim Prinz. Perhaps not everyone may know the background, so perhaps could you briefly explain the background of your composition? Yes, thank you, Michael. Joachim Prince was a rabbi, very outspoken rabbi in Berlin during the Nazi period. And he risked his life many times, saved many, many people because he was aware of what was really happening and got a lot of Jews to flee Germany. He was actually arrested by the Gestapo many times and 
talked his way out of it for a while because he said, I'm doing what you want. I'm getting Jews to leave Germany. Uh, eventually his life was in danger and he fled to the United States. And after a short time there, he realized that the African-American situation was similar to the Jewish situation from his perspective. And he became a civil rights advocate uh, and a friend of Martin Luther King. So the violin concerto, which we're gonna hear a short excerpt from, uh, the violin represents Joachim Prince, a, com a compassionate, compelling, intense voice uh, speaking to a, um, in, in the case of this movement, the first movement speaking against the Nazi regime. The orchestra is brutal and violent and, and the voice of Prince as the violin is the voice of compassion. So that's what we're gonna hear. This is from an excerpt uh, of a performance in Texas actually, um, with the violinist Scott St. John and the River Oaks Chamber Orchestra conducted by Michael Stern, who happens to be the son of Isaac Stern. Many thanks. So without further ado, we will show the um, excerpt of your composition. I will not remain silent. Thank you. 
So this last note is obviously really so powerful. Um, and we included also in the chat box, both under Zoom and under YouTube, the hyperlinks to the full recording and also background information of this wonderful work. Let me just follow up with a question to you, Bruce. Yes. Uh, how do you embed any messages into the music? For example, reflecting the, the history or quotes as you just did in your composition, I will not remain silent. How does that work? Yes, well, you know, the, the idea that music can speak Uh, we, we've heard some comments already about the power of music and the idea that maybe we cannot misunderstand music. But the, the idea that music speaks in metaphors and it speaks in the shape of drama. It speaks in the resonance of human action. So the violin representing Prince speaks uh, with a kind of compassion and intensity and a sense of urgency, which is very familiar to uh, someone who's trying to create action but also it's inflected with actual cantorial melodic fragments, ornamentation, uh, and the feeling of uh, Jewish cantorial music. Although there's no actual quote for any length of time, it's all embedded into the inflection of the style of the violin. Whereas the orchestra is drawing on a kind of brutality. So for example, the very end where you mentioned that last note, there are 21 violent orchestral strikes at the violin and the violin is holding one note and that note is not beaten down and we can hear easily what that means that the voice of one person can withstand that powerful assault and so uh, the metaphor is clear that that you have the individual which in many concertos this is the case the individual soloist represents the, a voice of a particular human being whereas the orchestra often is society wow. And in the case of this society in the first movement, um, the society is, is a um, evil, brutal, criminal society. And the voice is one of compassion, urgency, and almost desperation. But as I said, the, the end of that movement shows the power of the single voice. And it actually is literally that, a single voice against about 40 musicians trying to stop it from singing. Many thanks, and that's so powerful and also compelling the way you explain it. And I think, uh, let, let me bring in also Julian Pfeiffer, you know, who is the executive director of Musicians for Human Rights. And um, already from the title of your organization, Musicians for Human Rights, how do you see the relationship between the two? And I can imagine that it's not only a rosy picture, uh, but there are also negative sides. I mean, we just need to look at the current situation in Afghanistan and elsewhere. So uh, please uh, share your, your thoughts about that. Thank you, Michael. The, the relationship is complex. It's entwined in many positive ways and entangled in disheartening ways. Music serves fundamental values of human rights doctrine, particularly the full development of the human personality. And this occurs in contexts of education, the right to health and well being, the right to participate in the cultural life of the community, the right to privacy so you can sing, rehearse, perform at home, the right to <clears throat> freedom of religion and belief where music, of course, is a central component often of worship, observance, and ritual. And then, of course, of freedom of expression and opinion. <clears throat> On the positive side, for residents of prisons and correctional facilities, there have been notable increases in the quantity and quality of music making, which is the right to enjoy the arts, where the residents of the facilities themselves are composing, and performing, as well as enjoying performances by professional musicians, semi-professional ensembles, and conservatory students. Upon graduation from conservatory, increasing numbers of young musicians are immediately involving themselves with the vulnerable and marginalized residents in their communities, as well as supporting the dignity and resilience of people living in refugee camps when they can gain access to those camps. In hospitals, the medical profession is gradually expanding the use of music to help improve the rate and quality of patient recovery after surgical procedures. 
through music's use in clinical psychotherapy, as well as in community settings. <clears throat> music is helping to restore identity, reclaim selfhood, and enable constructive participation in the community. One specific example I'd like to mention is the Lullaby Project, which pairs pregnant women and new women and new <clears throat> mothers and fathers with professional artists to write and sing lullabies for their babies. And this supports maternal help, health, it aids childhood development, and it helps strengthen the bond between parent and child. It was commenced by Carnegie Hall in a socioeconomically challenged community in the South Bronx of New York. The program is now provided by local musicians and NGOs in dozens of cities and countries around the world. Lullabies are a basic and essential form of communication found in every culture, thus among the religious, the humanists, and the atheists. However, there are also serious problems. The world has become very aware of music used as an implement of torture, musicians themselves using music as a means to convey homophobic and mis misogynistic attitudes and to denigrate others generally. Furthermore, in a number of countries and cultures, intolerant religious beliefs deny women the right to study or perform music. In some regions, a person of any gender identity can be punished for making music. Dr. Shahid mentioned Afghanistan. We've heard it mentioned several times. I'm sure some of you were in the last couple of months, the entire faculty, students, administration, parents, of the students of the Afghanistan National Institute of Music have left that country and are setting up shop now in, in Qatar. Using music with or without lyrics to comment on suffering, protest, injustice, and the violation of human rights can lead to censorship, imprisonment, torture, and even death. In summary, we see that music can advance human dignity and strengthen community bonds and music is also used in violation of human rights. We at Musicians for Human Rights in partnership with the Global Campus of Human Rights in Venice, the SOAS University of London, and the University of Lucerne are examining these issues in a book to be published next year by Routledge, aptly titled Music and Human Rights. It may well be the first scholarly look at these issues that brings together perspectives from ethnomusicologists legal scholars, musicians, directors of NGOs, among others from around the world, and includes as well portraits by nearly two dozen human rights defenders working with or through music. We hope this volume will be a useful resource and inspire further research as we all continue our efforts. Thank you. Many thanks, Julian, for giving us also both the negative and the positive sides, and I couldn't agree more that uh, also academic research into these questions on music and human rights are important, as are the Lullaby Project, which I also find fascinating and very concrete uh, at, at a very um, local level. Um, we would now turn to our next artist, uh, who is um, uh, the artist and author Dessa. Uh, you were born into a Jewish family in southern Rhodesia, which is today Zimbabwe as the daughter of a Polish mother and a Hungarian <laughs> father who had established the first private medical practice in Bulawayo for black Africans. Since 1986, uh, there were over 40 exhibitions and presentations in museums, galleries, but also interestingly in concert halls. Um, and I'm saying it because one of the projects uh, that she has really um, uh, initiated is combining music and visual art which is called trans sound art, and also research concerning artistic expression for collective memory. So we will now here look at this um, joint uh, music and artistical improvisation, and then afterwards we'll have the interview. Trans sound art, a live improvisation between a painter and a musician.
Welcome, Dessa. And we have just been jointly improvising trans sound art type music and uh, painting. Would you mind explaining what trans sound art means? Yes, well, my, my concept is that as two people, when two people meet and speak in the street uh, spontaneously, you don't know what each one's going to say. The same thing is here that we converse non-verbally, spontaneously, um, you through your music and me through the colors, the brushes, the movement of, the movement of the brushes. So it's actually a conversation, but uh, totally improvised, as if we met and exchanged words, we meet and exchange sound and color and movement. And since you immerse really yourself into the music and then uh, get the inspiration also for this cycle of, of paintings, in that case of uh, Victor Ullmann's Absolutely. Last Piano Sonata, yeah. um, how, how does the music influence you? Oh, much. And I think the music draws from me and I draw from the music. It's actually, it's interesting. It's a kind of a give and take uh, relationship, much like we do live there, you know. Uh, it's, um, th as I said, the composer is there, even though he's not there physically. It's also when I work, for example, this other, not with music at all, this memory, I do these projects also to, uh, to, to as a homage to a particular person. I felt the person is often there too, you know, through, through what's going on, through, through these energies. What you're just saying there, it reminds me also of the title of uh, today's um, online event. It's Music for Faith for rights. So I have, you have basically three elements. You have music, faith and human rights. How does this resonate with you from an artistic perspective? Oh, how does it? I think, first of all, these are three, well, three topics you're saying that are intertwining, right? They're inter I think in, in the arts, the way I work, I'm constantly bringing together and I'm constantly uniting. In fact, it's part of my life uh, philosophy, I think, to, to, to unite rather than to separate. I and mean, that, I think, comes from my, my, my childhood in Africa, um, uh, separate uh, peoples and then separate uh, faiths. And, and I'm always looking to... And I think the, what you said is uh, human rights and bringing people together is what you're trying to... to I mean, I, I think I do this through in my art I've always been doing this without specifically saying what particular uh, part of humanity I want to bring together. I don't know if that makes any sense. Absolutely. And I was just myself asking um, the question how to convey messages, how to really transmit um, what you want to uh, transmit. And, and here, perhaps the, the different art forms through painting, through music, through other artistic expressions, they can collage, really yeah. mm -hmm. uh, collage mm -hmm. as you as you. I do a lot of collage. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, perhaps if you can uh, also, in that context, uh, explain a bit your work on collage, uh, which is also then linked to, oh, yeah. to the. No, so not not mm -hmm. the music, and not, I do some music collage, but that's that's not a, not at all what I'm what I mean here. When I do, when I work with um, with projects that are linked to history and um, and, and and memory of people. I take all, I, I do a lot of research, um, their story, where they were, their work, uh, their family, what, what they, their, their life. Uh, and I, I get all kinds, all these associations and then I put them together. In other words, what I'm doing is taking things that exist separately in image or in form, even some, it could be paper, it could be a photograph, it could be something, um, tissue, it could be a fab, a fab, um, a material. Um, even stones, I mean, it, 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 things, objects, and I bring them together and I make one whole out of all these different elements existing separately before I actually bring them together. The message, of course, is very clear for me. Um, but it's a, also something that is, has a, 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 an effect that I, I feel that at least I'm bringing the, these energies are combining to form something that's much 
more unique and stronger combined than, than leaving these elements where they're separate. So this was obviously uh, trans sound art and history. Um, and um, this, I think, is a nice uh, segue also to um, uh, a specific uh, string quartet um, in memory of Asma Jahangir, who used to be the special rapporteur on freedom of religion or belief between 2004 and 2010. Many uh, of the speakers have already uh, referred to her name and we are uh, uh, sorely missing her strong voice uh, in Pakistan and, and elsewhere. Um, so we'll listen to this uh, video, everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. And afterwards uh, have um, a short uh, interview with two of the musicians. So I'm starting the string quartet. Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion in memory of Asma Jahangir.
Ines, together with this string quartet, you just gave the world performance of a piece on religious intolerance, um, which is dedicated to the memory of uh, Asma Jahangir, who used to be the special rapporteur on freedom of religion or belief from 2004 to 2010. Would you mind showing us the motif Asma, which is embedded in actually your opening tune of this string quartet and explain how this is embedded? Yes, um, so I show you the opening theme of the quartet is actually the name of asthma. So I start out with the A, A, S, M, A. So it's the name of the notes. I can show you A, S, Mi. This is asthma. So, this is the, the opening theme in Forte, which is the most important um, um, gesture of, the, of this beginning of the quartet. Both you, Ines, and you, Verena, you are professional musicians at the Orchestre de la Suisse Romande here in Geneva. And you, Marina, you're also the chairperson of the German-speaking congregation of the Lutheran Church. Would you mind explaining a bit the background of this church building, actually? Yes, it's a really special background. It's 250 years old, right in the center of Geneva. And uh, from outside, you can not see that it's a church because we don't have a bell tower or a typical shape of a church. So at that time, when it was built in the end of the 18th century, uh, it was rather said not to show that there is a religious group inside of this building. Today's performance is part of a full week of interreligious activities here in Geneva. Can you explain a bit more about this cooperation here? Yes, we have a chance to have this interreligious platform in Geneva. And today, for example, <coughs> the Jewish and the Muslims shared their, uh, they exchanged their worship places and that shows a lot about the attitude uh, which people have in Geneva, or oh, very open-minded, I think. And it's a chance for us here, Lutherans, to, to be part of this open-minded world. <laughs> Thanks very much to yeah. both of you, Ines and Dorina. You're welcome. So with this aerial view of Geneva, uh, where you also saw the uh, Lutheran church, uh, which doesn't look like a church in the first place, we now turn to uh, Mostafa and to the minority fellows. First, we'll watch, um, as we already alluded to, uh, a fascinating music video, uh, which includes storytelling. And that's also one of the key features of uh, the Faithful Rights Toolkit, for example, really to give voice and to give a forum to the persons concerned. So let's first watch that video and then we'll come back to you. Um, so I'm sharing the video.
انا جايه النهارده احكي لكم عن مينا مينا طفل مصري قبطي عنده حوالي سبع سنين اتولد وعاش في مدينه العريش في شمال سينا اللي اصبحت بعد كده منطقه حرب ضد الارهاب في يوم مينا صحي على خبر قتل عمه بطلقه في الراس وابن عمه باشعال النيران فيه والسبب انه مسيحيين عيله مينا قالوا له احنا لازم نسيب بيتنا ونمشي حالا لازم نسيب المدينة اللي عشنا فيها عمرنا كله ونمشي ليه؟ لأن أنا مسيحيين عرف بعد كده مينا أن الجماعات الجهادية وتنظيم الدولة الإسلامية هو المسؤول عن الجرائم اللي بتحصل وأنه نشر فيديو بيهدد في مسيحيين مصر ومسيحيين سينا بالذات أنهم لازم يسيبوا المكان عرف مينا أنهم قتلوا حوالي سبع مسيحيين منهم عمو وابن عمو عائلة مينا هي عيلة من حوالي 258 عيلة تم تهجيرهم من شمال سيناء في عام 2017 العائلات دي هربت وسابت كل حاجة على وعد من الحكومة انهم هيرجعوا بعد 10 ايام لكنه ما حصلش الحكومة وعدتهم لكن ما وفتش بوعدها ولحد دلوقتي من 2017 الحكومة مش بتعترف ان العائلات المسيحية في شمال سيناء تم تهجيرهم قصريا قبل التهجير مينا ما كانش بيروح المدرسة بسبب انهم خايفين انه يتقتل البيت كان على طول ضلمة عشان الارهابيين ما يعرفوش ان في مسيحيين لسه عايشين في البيت كان دايما بيشوف بابا سهران جنب الشباك عشان يكون مستعد انه يواجه المسلحين لو هدموا اما يوم التقدير التهجير مينا ما قدرش ياخد غير شنطة صغيرة وساب كل كتبه والعابه في البيت اضطروا يهربوا بالليل عشان محدش يشوفهم مينا فضل طول الطريق يبص على بيته ومدرسته والنادي اللي كان بيروح فضل يسأل ايه مصيرنا؟ ايه مصير القطر؟ فين العداية؟ وهنرجع امتى بيتنا؟ هرجع امتى لمدرستي واصحابي؟ بالرغم من ان الدستور المصري في مادة رقم 63 بينص على انه يحضر التهجير القصر التعسفي للمواطنين بجميع صور واشكاله ومخالفه ذلك فهي جريمه لكن الحكومه المصريه ما زالت لا تعترف بهذه الجريمه حتى الان A boy was born in an ethnic and linguistic minority that was and still facing various types of discrimination and ethnic cleansing in the Middle East region. Few years later, he was baptized to join a religious minority that was and still facing discrimination, cleansing and consequently immigration. He was able to survive in a region where life is always under threat on various levels where belonging to a minority makes your suffering a collateral damage, your name forced to be officially replaced, your language almost forbidden, your present not important, neither your future. You are just someone who is waiting to immigrate or live under severe circumstances without having any rights to participate in any kind of decisions. This boy was able to grow learn his history, analyze his present, and plan for the future. A future that can be brightened by uniting, collaborating, and constantly seeking opportunities for positive change. He ensured that all the communities became part of his identity, his life, a life that he valued throughout all the survival and sacrifices he made. He is fully aware that standing up for all human rights is the only way to save his community, other communities, his country, his region, and his world. اسمي 
فيها المعلوم ولا تزوبك حكايتي هي حكاية الحراطين بموريتانيا عشتوا كما يعيش العديد من الأسر الحراطين ظروف بالغة الصعوبة أن تكون تنتمي للحراطين فأنت ضحية التهميش تضحية الاستعباد تضحية استبعاد تضحية الإقصاء الممنهج السلبي ضدك في مختلف المجالات ولذا نحن ندافع عن قضاء الحراطين وندفع ثمن هذا الدفاع ندفع ثمن نضالاتنا ندفعه من خلال إقصائنا ندفعه من خلال تغييبنا الممنهج اليوم سياسات الدولة اليوم لا تزال تكرس تكرس واقع الذي يعيشه الحراطين وهو واقع يتميز بأنهم في المرتبة الدنيا في المجتمع يعيشون ظروف أقرب لأن يكونوا مواطنين من الدرجة الثانية إلى الآن نعتبر بأننا نناضل بقوة من أجل أن يسمع صوتنا ولهذا الغرض ومن أجل هذا السبب لازم تسمعونا وتسمعوا صوتنا بقوة وتسمعوا كذلك المطالب التي ننادي من أجلها وتسمعوا كذلك المسار النضالي والكفاح الذي نقوم به من أجل الإنصاف وتحقيق العدالة وإنصاف ضحايا العبودية الحراطين في موريتانيا عيسى شاب في العقد العشرين من عمره عاش ويعيش في منطقة منكشفة أمنيا بفعل أحداث العنف الطائفية والعرقية التي تنشب بين الفينة والأخرى ولعل آخرها تلك التي حصلت ما بين سنة 2013 و2015 أين عرفت المنطقة أحداثا دامية خلفت عديد الجرحى والقتلى دون الحديث عن الخسائر المادية الفادحة حيث كان عيسى ضحية خلالها حيث تعرض إلى إصابات وحرق لمنزله وتهجيره منه رفقة عائلته وللسجن التعسفي لعديد من أفراد عائلته وأقاربه عيسى لم ينس تلك الحادثة الأليمة وهو طفل صغير أين كان القدر حافظا له من الموت حينما نزل هو وصديقه لاستقبال رئيس الدولة أنذاك قبل أن ينتبه له جموع من المواطنين الغير محسوبين على أقليته العرقية والدينية حيث تفطن له أنه من غير أقليتهم من خلال الزي الخاص الذي كان يلبسه عيسى ويختص به أفراد أقليته حيث سارع عيسى إلى أحد أفراد الأمن لطلب الحماية والأمن إلا أنه صدم بتجاهله له قبل أن يهجم عليه العشرات من العنصريين وينهالوا عليه بالضرب وإسماعه عبارات عنصرية مهينة عيسى ما زال يطمح لدولة العدل والقانون ما زال يطمح في الحصول على المساواة وتحقيق التعايش المشترك لأن عيسى تربى على والديه على حب الآخرين والإحسان لهم ومساعدتهم وقت الحاجة عيسى يسمعكم صوته وصرخته آملا في غد أفضل لجميع البشر بغض النظر عن لغتهم وعرقهم ولونهم الولدين الولدين قول انسند من لال الولدين الولدين ايوة هلا دي سان ايوة مت هلا دي سان
So that is a uh, very powerful uh, storytelling by these uh, minority fellows. And you, Mustafa, uh, you are also coordinating them and, and your work with refugees in the Netherlands. Um, you also are very concretely using um, music and art uh, for basically um, uh, memorializing and for, for helping and supporting uh, um, uh, these uh, refugees. If you wouldn't mind uh, explaining also the RTL project, which uh, we will also include as a hyperlink in the comment box. Over to you, Mustafa. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, also, I'm playing with the, the team and I would like to thank all the Spotlight team, all my followers, because they are really great and always in, in the line when we want to do something really powerful. Uh, we have Ertijal, it's mean improvisation project. Uh, we are collecting musicians, dancers and filmmakers to improvise with each other here in Netherlands and in Europe. And uh, now we are in the second year with this project, so successful one, uh, and we, we will continue, actually. We have also, we launched with the Minority Fellows a great campaign uh, when the pandemic starts, uh, uh, when the world pauses, music and dance continue. Uh, yeah, now we will uh, make uh, a big event here in Netherlands related on the same campaign. And we have a project called Sufi Blue. It's for uh, immigrants and refugee to express themselves through music and dance uh, about the journey, about how they are feeling when they are here or why, where, if, if they are everywhere, actually. Also, we are working inside the refugee camps with the organization called Vrolikai, that means happiness. Uh, also through the art, we are supporting children, women, uh, families, uh, youth, uh, all of these, uh, let's say, effort uh, just to support the people through the art and culture and give them the possibility to be part of this community. So simply, this is what we have. And please, uh, if you want to see more about us, you can uh, see the link in the chat box and see the video about Ertijal. And thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Mustafa, and uh, I hope that we will also have a, a follow-up webinar uh, where we can also showcase some of these additional um, uh, uh, activities. We um, will now look into a music video um, and an interview with uh, Dr. Munir Alkaderi Butchich. Um, uh, and uh, again, um, you will see uh, a, a very uh, um, a musical context and uh, spiritual background, which uh, he will explain and with which the musicians um, will uh, uh, show directly. We now turn to Dr. Munir Erkaderi Butchich, who is president of the Foundation Al Muntaka in Dakar in Morocco, and also of the International Sufi Forum. Dr. Munir, before we will listen to a music video by a group Safa Belgique, would you mind explaining what is the significance, what is the role of musical recitation in the Sufi tradition? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa salim taslima. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your invitation to talk about art of Sama. Sufi song or spiritual song. I am very happy to share with you this moment of conviviality, spirituality and peace. The Sama, which means spiritual hearing, has been used for hundreds of years to connect with the divine through recitations of poetic lyrics using a voice and the sounds like and the famous dervish order of Jalal al-Din Rumi. The Sama is unique art produced by Sufism to celebrate the beauty and the love of God and his messenger, the Prophet Sayyidina Muhammad, may peace be upon him. The Prophet, may peace be upon him, in his time, followed by Sufi masters and educators 
always have the mission of making man aware of beauty and all creations. The famous Egyptian Sufi, Ibn Atayillahi Iskandari, said, and one of his wisdom, beings not created for you to see them, but for you to see their Lord in them. The Sama is an expression of the desire for God's love and the proximity. It carries eternal meanings, wisdom and divine truth, noble virtues and prophetic manners. The Sama is an entrance to the through of divine heart. It is heard and perceived by the heart. It speaks the universal languages of the heart. This is why anyone can be touched by its energy and illumination. In Sufism, which is the heart of Islam and the station of excellence, Maqam al Ihsan, the Sama is an invocation, dhikr in Arabic, and an educational practice. God says, and the Holy Quran, surely and the remembrance of Allah do hearts find comfort. This is why the Sama is considered an elevated form of worship and contemplation of God's creation.
here, what is the source and effects, personal and societal, of the joy that one notices on the faces of the performers, as we just saw in this music video by Group Safa Belgique? Good question, Michael. In fact, anyone who listens to Sama would feel happiness and joy. The famous Sufi master Al Junaid said, spiritual hearing moves what is in the heart. One of the goals of Sufi education is to perceive and achieve true beauty internally and externally, to elevate human beings towards a divine, luminous, and sacred space. During Sama, the heart of the believer vibrates with divine light, which receives eternal truths and subtle meanings. The Sama reveals the secrets of divine love and his mercy. It brings the believer into spiritual state like for the recitation of the Quran when God says and when they hear what has been revealed to the messenger, you see their eyes overflowing with tears because of what they have recognized of the truth. وإذا سمعوا ما أنزل إلى الرسول ترى عيونهم تفيض من الدمع مما عرفوا من الحق. The sama nourishes and awakens the heart. It makes us test, love, and appreciate our connection to the divine. It opens up a space of love and divine peace. In Morocco's history, the sama was always present to communicate this language of hearts and the beauty. Today, in the Tariq al-Qadir al-Bouchishiya, the Sama has a special scent. It's done a cappella with a combination of Oriental and Arabo and Illusion melodies, which gives it a unique creativity and makes it a source of inspiration to other forms and groups of Sama. Our Sama is from the universal repertoire of Sufi poetry, such as that of uh, Shushtari, uh, Ibn Farid, Rabi al Adawiya, Attar al Hallaj, or Sidi Hamza, our late grandfather. In our modern, in our modern material world, the Sama is a noble art that uh, bridges cultures and civilizations and helps <clears throat> propagate universal values, peace, and love. Dr. Monir uh, explained the Sufi spiritualism, uh, spirituality and uh, the music making in the background uh, beautifully. And um, we have almost uh, reached the end of, of the uh, music uh, history uh, or musical journey. We have one um, uh, journey again through the 18 commitments of the Beirut Declaration on Faithful Rights. So what you listen now by Dr. John Graz, who was also one of the um, co-authors in Beirut uh, almost five years ago, he will recite to you basically 18 tweets, because that was one of the exercises that we, for example, did in Marrakesh and in, in various webinars that we asked the participants to condense, to summarize each of the 18 commitments into a maximum 140 characters as a tweet. And so what you will listen now is again an improvisation where John is reading each of the 18 summarized tweets um, and uh, so that, that may give you an overview of uh, the whole 18 commitments on faithful rights. So I'm sharing the... Uh... The 18 commitments on faithful rights.
our most fundamental responsibilities is to stand up and act for everyone's right to free choices and particularly for everyone's freedom of thought, conscience, religion or beliefs. present declaration on faith for right as a common minimum standard for believers, whether theistic, non-theistic, atheistic, or others. Religions are necessarily subject to human interpretations. We commit to promote constructive engagement on the understanding of religious text. of state religion to discriminate and we commit to prevent the use of doctrinal secularism from reducing the space for religious or beliefs pluralism. discrimination and gender equality in implementing this declaration on faith for rights. for the rights of all persons belonging to minorities and to defend their freedom of religion or belief. of advocacy of hatred that incites to violence, discrimination or hostilities, including those that lead to atrocity crimes. determinations or other religious views that manifestly conflict with universal human rights, norms and standards. determination by any actor who in the name of religion aims 
at disqualifying the religion or belief of another individual or community. We pledge not to give credence to exclusionary interpretations claiming religious ground in a manner that would instrumentalize religions, beliefs, or their followers. commit not to oppress critical voices and we urge states that still have anti-blasphemy or anti-apostasy laws to repeal them. commit to further refine the curriculums, teachings, materials, and textbooks whether some religious interpretation may give rise to the perception of condoning violence or discrimination. to build on experiences and lessons learned in engaging with children and youth who are either victims or vulnerable to incitement to violence in the name of religion. to guarantee that humanitarian aid is given regardless of the recipient's creed and that aid will not be used to further a particular religious standpoint. situations into converting from their religion or beliefs while fully respecting everyone's freedom to have, adopt or change a religion or belief. to leverage the spiritual and moral weight of religions and beliefs with the aim of strengthening the protection of universal human rights and developing preventive strategies. of developing sustained partnerships with specialized academic institutions. We pledge to use technological means more creatively and consistently 
in order to disseminate this declaration and subsequent phase four rights messages. It was the 18 commitments on phase four rights. Well, inspiring would be an utterly understatement to describe these almost two and a half hours that we spent together, at least for me, without even blinking. Instead of thanking all the speakers and the participants and the artists, I think I, I owe you all an apology for having to come back to words after this flood of beauty that carried the meanings much, much higher than any word can do. And I think, and I will try to be telegraphically uh, describing some takes away from this uh, after apologizing for coming back to words. It almost feels like Adam and Eve kicked out of heaven and now down to earth. What would I say? What would I take away from this? I think I would take away that artists are probably the most powerful human rights defenders. They may not be seen as such, but the main difference between art in general, music, was a locomotive tonight, but with the music comes all, for, uh, all sorts of artistic expressions. Probably the main difference is sincerity. One cannot lie when one is artistically expression, expressing a feeling. We saw it with the fellows storytellings, but we saw it with each and every uh, other performance. So art is probably the, the language of art, and it brought us to the heart of human rights, the beating heart of human rights today. I think this also takes us to the heart of two other notions, interdisciplinarity and diversity. Uh, transmission, uh, transound art, mixing arts together, one of the striking, striking images I saw tonight is that document of the General Assembly and as a background for an artist and a dancer at the same time. It felt different, the title of that document, absolutely different. Um, and I think that the more we have this interdisciplinarity and linking the dots between different streams of human uh, communication sources and tools, the more we reach something much higher. Today, it was a dialogue between law and art, but it led to a third language, probably the language of truth. Again, you cannot lie. You can like or not like a performance, but you know it's sincere and you have no doubt about it. And you can listen to the most sophisticated speech or report and you can be misled because words can mislead Art can never be misunderstood. It's another lesson from today. Also, irtigal, uh, improvisation. To lie, you need to plan. If you are improvising, you cannot lie because you cannot plan, simply. So all of these are meanings coming out of this improvisation and this combination of beauty and of interaction that leads always to something new. 
there is nothing. If you recompose and recombine the different streams of expression and art that we had tonight, 1,000 times, each time it will be different. Again, the endlessness of human generosity, of wisdom, and of truth. So with all of this, I think uh, 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 it would have been very sad to say that every beautiful thing comes to an end. So we decided that what we gather today will be immortalized by becoming one of the tools of the Faithful Rights Toolkit. So the whole YouTube will be presented and commented in the toolkit as one of the main ways of trying to understand that culture and music are additions to human rights. We need to rehabilitate culture. Again, words deceive, and we are prisoners of the perceptions of words. When I say culture in any human rights context, the first word that would come to mind is cultural relativism, the enemy of universality of values and of human dignity. But culture is exactly, this is 5% this is of manipulation of culture. The 95% get disappeared, unless you stop talking about culture and you practice it and you taste it. And that's what we uh, uh, did tonight. Uh, I want to thank you, Michael, because with the pianist came the florist. I think uh, the art of combining all of this, we owe it to the artists, of course, but those who compose and, and, and put this bouquet together uh, uh, deserve a special thanks to you and to your partners in organizing this event. Um, and because it will be immortalized and kept in the toolkit, we will also end, uh, we, will, we, will, we will end our gathering now, but you're all invited and feel free to continue with uh, the last but not least of performances, which is the journey of gender equality. We are zooming here in art, in music, on commitment five of the 18 commitments on faithful rights. And this journey of gender equality, again, was done through songs by different people from across the world. With this, thank you all very much for all your contributions. We spent precious moments uh, that we will keep for others to build on and to add to. Thank you very much and have a good evening all. commit to ensure non-discrimination and gender equality, particularly regarding harmful stereotypes and practices or gender-based violence. We pledge to ensure non-discrimination and gender equality in implementing this declaration on faith for rights. specifically commit to revisit each within our respective areas of politics, those religious understandings and interpretations that appear to perpetuate gender inequality, harmful stereotypes, or even condone gender-based violence.
ensure justice and equal worth of everyone, as well as to affirm the right of all women, girls, and boys not to be subjected to any form of discrimination and violence. des capacités devrait cibler les dirigeants influents. Notamment les chefs traditionnels et religieux. Guru Granth Sahib Ji, Pand Jamiye, Pand Nimiye, Pand Mangan Vyaho, Pando Hove Dosti, Pando Chale Raho, Pand Mua Pand Paliye, Pand Hove Bandhan, So Kyo Manda Aakhiye, Jit Jamme Raja, Pando Hi Pand Upje, Pande Baj Na Koye, Nanak Pande Bahra, Ikko Sacha Soye, The world of humanity is possessed of two wings, the male and the female. So long as these two wings are not equivalent in strength, the bird will not fly. Until womankind reaches the same degree as man, until she enjoys the same arena of activity, extraordinary attainment for humanity will not be realized. Abdullah. This is our commitment. A fantastic performance, Ibrahim Michael. Well done. Thank you so much to everyone. It was a wonderful journey together. See you soon. And thank you very much. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you very much.